more, much more secure, much safer than anything you can learn from a PHP cookbook. Uh, because if you implement, mm, well, look, I, I still, I still keep end users separated from database users. So my end users are not represented in terms of a native SQL security system. They are not database users, but the whole security system is implemented inside a database. If you implement any access control system, uh, no matter how sophisticated it is, there are always will be a possibility to bypass your security, uh, your access control system entirely, because this access control system will require a privileged link to a database. Contrary to this. Uh, I don't need a privileged link between my scripts and my database. So such a bypass is impossible and from in some sense useless because nobody knows the password of the privileged user. We simply do not need any script to connect with so much permissions. The only option to connect is the reader user who is not permitted to do anything evil. You can publish his password on the internet, and also you can publish all your scripts on the internet. It is no longer a security threat. And also you can stop worrying about SQL injections. If someone managed to inject an, ISK, an SQL, it will be executed, and it will do absolutely nothing, simply because the reader user is not permitted to do it. So I still insist Database is the best tool for arranging access control, but we need to make another step. And here goes my proposal. Since we have, since we have described all user actions, since we have described all data access methods, the interaction between the interaction between database and client has been reduced to mere sequence of method calls so we don't need sql to be exposed to a client anymore i propose uh, to create an alternative interface to a database the interface which will recognize only our predefined method calls. Not a rocket science, just another interface, but very helpful. And by the way, no SQL. SQL haters must be happy. Look what we all do while programming so-called application layer. All things considered, we merely hiding SQL from a client. Struggling against SQL injection possibilities. And it is extremely dull, you know, boring and important labor. Also featuring high risk of a mistake. And I will... I will be very surprised if you don't hate this part of your labor. So what I say, I say stop exposing SQL to the client instead of hiding it. If you don't expose it, there is no need for hiding. What is the primary source of SQL injection? It's a, it's a context switching. In uh, an SQL parser allows you to switch voluntarily between data and common context. This is why your client script, while taking data, must not expect data, but it must 
make sure it's taken data. Uh, in my proposal, we have single context. Everything is data, no context switching. So uh, SQL injection is not possible by design. Actually, any sort of any injection is not possible because of the absence of context switching. Also, the absence of SQL parser has two positive side effects in handling uh, large objects and error reporting and type checking. Uh, we will discuss it a little bit later in the second part. But now I want to discuss uh, security issues of this proposal from the opposite perspective, from the perspective of the database. A typical application uh, contains several classes of end users permitted to different actions. In my case, we store user permissions in the database and we perform access control by means of stored procedures. And this seemingly unusual practice uh, makes your code clean and simple, pretty straightforward, because every data access method referring to the user to the user table decides for itself whether to authorize a given user to to action to a particular action or not. And all information regarding regarding user authorization for a particular method is localized inside this method. Unlike classical grant revoke approach, uh, where every permission is always a result of interference of numerous rules, which may appear in every location of your source code. And finally, what I propose is a perfect implementation of the deny by default policy what is not allowed is not even defined. We define all the data access methods and they are all, in some sense, allowed. We do not define anything that is not allowed for a user. However, there is a popular objection. They say we cannot codify each and every user's action, it's immense, vast, ungraspable. Well, it's very popular and seemingly powerful objection. But the brief reply is, in one way or another, you have to do something equivalent to this. Whatever technique you use, every programmer, whatever technique he uses, is always doing something equivalent to codifying each and every user action. Because every program is a some sort of codification of user actions. It was the brief reply. But this seemingly powerful objection is so thoroughly wrong and so popular that it requires a detailed reply. If you doubt, I, I've heard this objection a thousand times, and I, I, I even heard a, uh, uh, oh my God, humorous version, a comic version. Stored procedures? No thanks. Well, here's the detailed reply. First, we must pay attention to what we have. Does someone recognize the picture? <laughs> okay, we have we have completely artificial, determined computing environment of which the every state, the every transition, is defined by humans. Generally speaking, by you. 
what is not defined in this environment does not even exist. So you have to define everything you need. In one way or another, you have to define each and every user action. The only question is which way. And there is, there are two big alternatives. Uh, let's call them for future reference the first approach and the second approach. Uh, the first approach is to define a minimal set of generalized operations of which the transitive closure will include all operations we actually need. And the second is brute force to define each operation we need individually. The first approach is apparently elegant. It's utterly elegant. It's so elegant that it is irresistibly attractive for anyone. And it is always implemented by someone else. What a luck. But our brute reality favors the second approach, strangely enough. Haven't you seen yourself subtly sleeping from doing the first approach to doing the second in your everyday job? And there is a reason to do so. And this reason is more powerful than simply our user needs a fancy web form. The practical difference between these approaches really shines in the light of the access control. In order to create a secure system, you have to thoroughly examine all possible user scenarios and divide them into two classes, a class of valid operations and a class of invalid operations. It's pretty obvious. And then you have to elaborate a security system, uh, access, control, access control rules, which will allow valid operations and at the same time disallow invalid ones, where the both requirements are equally important. While the first one is pretty straightforward, the second one is always tricky, because the set of invalid operations can contain the rest of the universe. And if we practice the first approach, we apply our access rules to the set of all possible operations. And by doing this, we indirectly define which subset, what subset of this set of all operations represents valid operations. And also, we give a potential access to our users to the set of all operation. Because of this, because of this potential access, we have to prove that our access rules cover this set properly. So you have, you have avoided codifying the finite set of valid user operations. And now you are facing the infinite set of all operations. And you cannot simply test each and every one of them for being allowed or disallowed. This time, you need sort of analytical proof. And even if this proof exists, God knows how complex it is. The problem also complicated is also complicated by the formal model of access rules, namely grant revoke model. You have to mm, formal model of formal model of access rules in SQL itself is an implementation of the first approach. You have to formalize your high-level access rules in very basic terms of grant revokes so that every permission, every rule, 
every rule you codify in SQL is a result of interference of numerous low-level rules so that connection between the effort and the reaction is pretty obscure. Theoretically, every little change to a basic rule can, can cause, can affect all operations. Uh, let me illustrate this problem with analogy. The closest analogy of the first approach is polynomial interpolation. Now imagine your user actions as specific data points. Uh, let's say our client, clients, I have to be able to perform operations A, B, C, D. Uh, then the permission is a function defined on these data points which give us certain values in each point. Say our input is in these given points the permission function must have the given values. And our goal is to restore the formula restore the formula which describes the curve which connects all the given data points. This formula is an, is an analogy of our grant revoke rules. And if we succeed, if you finally figure out this formula and we restored our permission function, then we must make sure that it is not defined anywhere besides the original data points because we do not want our, we do not want to grant any excessive permissions to our users but it looks absurd totally absurd and, and it is the absurd of our everyday life in, in SQL with, with grant revokes we are struggling for crea we struggle for creating a generalized access rule universally applicable access rule while the generalization is in fact a crucial disadvantage if not a security hole itself we have to fight against the result of our labor this is why grant revokes will never work as intended, no matter how many new permission classes you introduce to your system. They already introduced thousands of them, and it doesn't help. But why do we bother with interpolation in the first place if we are not interested in its result? Our grant revoke approach really looks like an interpolation with the only intention to get rid of its result. So what if we employ a piecewise defined function which is only defined in the given data points exactly as we want it? This is the analogy of the second approach. We can define each data access method coupled with its permission and expose them and only them to a client. Therefore, we, we do not care what permissions will be applied to the rest of the operations because we simply do not expose them. Pretty simple proposal. Define all data access methods. Make them authorize and authenticate your end users. 
and create a special NoSQL typeless interface to access these methods. Nothing more. This is a good moment for asking questions. And after questions, we will proceed to the next part about type checking. Um, I have a question about, uh, so what he typically, what I typically see is that in a nice um, uh, system you have users and permissions, but then you also have uh, common uh, groups of permissions grouped together, and you want to give that uh, a role name, and then you want to assign users to that role, and then have the permissions of that role. Are you thinking as complex as that here? It, do it doesn't solve the problem. Because uh, if you replace individual users with uh, groups of users or roles, uh, you will have the same picture. It's a self-similar picture. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Uh, I agree with that, but I was just wondering if you're thinking if you want that kind of authentication in the database or just simple uh, authentication. Uh, this is up to you. Okay. If you wish, you, you can... Actually, the one of the principal advantages of this proposal is arbitrary complexity of your access permissions. So it is up to you what permissions do you want. If you want access control system which involves groups and roles, you're welcome. Propose uh, making the uh, functions privileged, but uh, but it's uh, there is uh, quite a lot of uh, problems with ZUAE bits on Unix and with uh, uh, Java security with privileged classes. It's uh, often a source of security holes Be because the uh, uh, the uh, attacker has quite a lot of control over such such a privileged component. What do we say to this? So uh, I guess I I said it on, on the fifth slide. Sorry. The whole access control system is localized inside the database. There is no interface to the database to take, to seize a control over, over crucial elements, or, or, over crucial parts of the system. Absolutely no way. Because it's isolated from the outside world, unlike uh, these Java and PHP examples you mentioned. Did I answer? Yes, they are fixed. And it, it, it is only a matter of bug in your system. If you want to make mistakes in your methods, then you will probably have a hole. But if you don't make mistakes, it's okay, it's, it's safe. But classical grant revoke um, approach, it, it actually provokes errors e even, if, even if you employ a very skilled programmer. Uh, because of this thing that I, that I mentioned, with grant revoke approach, you have to prove somehow that your system is secure. In my approach, the system implementation is a proof of itself. You see? Any other questions? Yeah, you st store the methods in the, the database, and are these coded in SQL? Uh, in, in my applications, I'm keeping in mind, they are coded in PLPG SQL, the 
Postgres procedural language. That's the answer. Um, if you if you're still using uh, SQL underneath, aren't you just shifting the problem from PHP to PLPG SQL? I mean, there you still concatenate uh, SQL strings based on user input. No, no, it is not a shift of the problem because uh, we, but by doing this, uh, by following my proposal, we uh, eliminate the privileged link between database and an adjacent component. No privilege linked, no privilege link, uh, no possibility of seizing control of a database. So we eliminate uh, the crucial point. We eliminate a bottleneck of, of the security. Um, I'm trying to understand this. Um, but because the, the SQL is still, still being constructed, right, based on user input. So even though there is no raw SQL going from your programming language to, uh, to the database, there's still user input going from your programming language to your database. And based on that user input, you can still, if you're very persistent, you can still uh, put your uh, injections into this SQL, right? Not right, because uh, there is no, by, by design, there is no possibility of SQL injection. Oh my God, where is it? Everything is data. How are you going to inject any command? There is no context switching. All method arguments are pretty defined. So you, you, you cannot ask uh, the system to do anything besides what is already encoded. You see, the SQL, the SQL that is underneath this system, it is not exposed at all. Yes, the same is true, but you have to make it true time and again, routinely, each time you, each time you introduce every new field in your database, you have to repeat this routine for making the user input sure, you str you constantly you are constantly struggling for input purification. That's the nightmare I want to get rid of. I will admit that most of those uh, many of languages like PHP uh, make it easy to do it wrong and simply <laughs> interpolate. Uh, user input into SQL and that leads to SQL injections, but uh, but in all languages it is possible uh, to do it right, uh, to use your user placeholder and uh, user input will appear as a string and there is no possibility for SQL injection. Uh, so basically your your approach it's it's a bit different, but the basic thing it does is that it uh, switches uh, those uh, two things around. That it makes it hard uh, to, uh, to do the way that uh, leaves an SQL injection and makes it easy, uh, obvious, uh, to do it right. No SQL injection. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for this comment. So we proceed to the next part. The simplest uh, positive side effect of this proposed interface is handling of large objects. Uh, since we have a trivial interface of the name, oh, oh, I'm sorry, of the form, command name, the list of arguments, where arguments are just chunks of data, no types, no SQL parser involved. 
the large ob uh, input of large objects can be performed uniformly with the rest of the data. You, you don't have to maintain a special interface for handling large objects by passing SQL parser, because you don't have SQL parsing. Everything is uniform, everything is in, in one request. Well, the, <clears throat> the other positive side effect is type checks. You can perform type checks inside your method. Though, you may object that it is not an advantage uh, because, yes, you, you, I can perform type checks inside my method, but also I have to perform these type checks. And it is not an advantage, it is a burden. Surprisingly, it is an advantage. Because of this, because of this must, you have, you have control over reporting of all errors in one place. Taking into account that type mismatch errors are the most probable ones. Traditionally, there is a big problem with matching types, with type mismatch errors. They are divided into meaningless subtypes. Matching a basic type and matching a user-defined subtype. The former is detectable by SQL parser and it causes the error reporting of one manner while the latter is undetectable by SQL parser and you have to deal with type checking anyway causing the error reporting of another causing the error reporting of another manner and then you have to eliminate somehow this distinction in order to get, uh, in order to give a non-confusing, uh, self, self-consistent error report to a, to a user. Let me guess. Uh, yeah. Example goes first. Here's a rough example, oversimplified as usual, but I bet you will recognize the very common situation. Here is the traditional function uh, which has to be fed by user input. Uh, the group ID, the group ID argument shown in yellow is one of our interests. Let's call this function feeding it with user input group ID. And then this user input will will be checked for type ma for matching its for matching its type twice, once here and then here, that, so that the pretty atomic and simple error wrong group ID will suddenly become two distinct errors. One for those values of group ID which does not represent an integer, and another for those values which represent an integer, but still do not represent valid group ID. And I ask you, do you need this distinction in practice? Well, the both alternatives the both alternatives do equally not represent a group ID. And it is the only interesting fact about this error. Uh, let me guess. You are using a special framework on top of your database, which allows you to walk around this problem easily. Don't you? So, my question is, what do you prefer? To solve 
the problem routinely, time and again, even with ease, or to get rid of the problem once and for all. I choose the second. Also, typeless interface relieves you from type system incompatibility issues. A framework that you probably connect your database to uh, does have its own does have its own type system, and this system does does not have to be identical to the SQL type system, and they always differ, and it is always a problem. Even worse, they sometimes almost identical, which means the same full scale problems, but barely detectable. Contrary to this, typeless interface matches any type system. Let me summarize the advantages of my proposal before we proceed to the third part. Uniform input of large objects, uniform and precise error reporting, no more piles of type conversion, this last one, no more SQL injections, no more excessive permission grants, arbitrary complexity of access rules, you know grant revokes are pretty limiting. Clean and straightforward notation, predictable location of access rules. It's very important when you're analyzing your code, uh, especially regarding security. And deny by default. These advantages eliminate the every last excuse for having an ugly framework on top of your finely crafted database. The only disadvantage is obvious, this interface has to be created. Now ask your questions, but fast, because we have a third part about very interesting problem of error reporting. No questions for this part. Good. Next. Uh, yet again, I'm going to discuss a hidden problem, uh, a problem which many of you probably do not perceive as a problem at all. And yet again, I'm going to make you say, I am using a framework, so it is not a problem. And this is exactly the indication of a problem, because if you employ another piece of software, you better have to you better have a good reason to do so. SQL has pretty elaborated, somewhat somewhat special, but precise error reporting system with unique and foreign keys with table and um, field constraint, you can specify a very complex boundary of your data model. And in case of an error, you can obtain precise information which part of this boundary has been trespassed. But in spite of this, we actually never utilize SQL error messages. Do we? Try to catch or prevent SQL errors. We develop wrappers. We check input. We check input trying to predict which error the given input will cause instead of getting SQL error messages from the server. So why? Safety, a little. Efficiency, maybe, I doubt. Foremost, comprehensibility. Generally, a constraint violation message is pretty accurate about is pretty accurate in terms of data model, but it gives us absolutely no idea how to fix the input that has caused us the error. Example, very important example. Here's a, here's a table participants depicting the relation between persons and events. Uh, uh, let's say 
an event organizer invites someone to the particular event. He puts, he puts a tuple into participant's table signed as invitation. And few seconds later, the very same someone asks for participation. What he do? He put the record in the same table for the same event and for himself. Obviously, he will get error, duplicate key. From, from the perspective of the data, from the perspective of SQL, it is just a duplicate primary key. How the user will interpret this message? He will think, oh, I probably put my, uh, my request, so I, I, I shall wait for an answer. While the message is precisely the opposite, so we have misled our users, both of them, we make them both wait forever for each other to respond. This is why we never utilize SQL error messages. Not because of human readability, which could be solved by simple dictionary, but because we need error reporting in completely different terms. We want to know what's wrong with our input and how to fix it. SQL barely specifies, barely specifies uh, semantic of a constraint. And it does not specify any semantic of any constraint violation. Traditional data model contains only facts about valid data states and knows nothing about the rest. But we require the knowledge about mistakes. We want our data theory, let's call it data theory, to include alongside known facts about valid data, a factoid of data definition violation in order to classify all cases of definition violation and to give for each class profound semantic from domain knowledge. We want to know why each particular definition violation happens. What we can do? Theoretically, we can somehow extend DDL, but how exactly, I, I don't know. Your ideas are welcome, really, but beware, this is very tricky part. This is, this is very tricky, I, I, I thought about it. Alternatively, I propose to apply validity checks to the input and only to the input. Since we have already described all access methods, we only have to modify them slightly in the following matter. This block diagram speaks for itself, I hope. So, we don't have time for examples. These were real examples, believe me. And we go straight to conclusion. Traditionally, we have data in some state. And the definition with which the every possible data state must comply. And if you want to alter the data, we specify the difference between the present and the desired states. And in case of an error, the system informs us which particular part of this definition has been violated. So that the effort and the reaction are hardly related. At least they are expressed in completely different terms. In my paradigm, we have a data in some state. And we have a definition with which the every state transition must comply. And we specify the parameters 
of the desired transition, and then, see, then the system validates these parameters, and in case of an error, it informs us which particular part of our input violates the definition. And if everything is, is okay, only then system calculates the new state. So that the effort and the reaction are closely related and expressed in the same terms. Questions? I have found in practice that uh, certain race conditions uh, can only be detected with the traditional paradigm because uh, uh, whatever you try to do with uh, checking first and then applying a change, it's always possible that, uh, that someone uh, uh, makes a change in the middle and, uh, and all these uh, uh, locking uh, strategies uh, don't always work. And a unique constraint, I, that's the only thing I've, uh, I've seen that, that always works. Thank you very much for this question. I, I couldn't expect more convenient, more desired question. It is actually a part of my next speech. <laughs> so, welcome. Join me tomorrow and we will discuss this problem briefly. Uh, it is. Uh, it could be solved by advisory logs applied to each data access method. And advisory logs, you know, they are very efficient. And unlike uh, traditional logs, mm, le le let's say they are safer. Uh, you can you can log data more precise. Well, we can talk about this tomorrow, but briefly, it could be say it, it, it is possible to be solved by means of advisory logs themselves and nothing more. Because you have all data access methods uh, already defined, and you always know uh, which part of your data every access method. Mm. is going to change. Yeah? The, disadvantage, the, the disadvantage of, say, famous disadvantage of advisory log is, is that it is advisory. So you have to check this log manually on your own behalf before performing any action, yes? But defining access method solves this problem. Because you encapsulate in one method, checking the advisory log, and then perform uh, performing the actual the action. You see. Any other questions? So see you tomorrow. The next speech is going to be more exciting, more theoretical and is going to shake the grounds of the very SQL of the query language itself. 11 tomorrow in this room.